you know, you can just keep doing any of these, really. I won't go through it again. Um, but that's that's how you, you just have to make sure you calculate your hex value, which is what we have had entered in back in our read holding register. So you do have the option of dropping down and picking a hex. You'll see it switches to A. You can enter in this value in hex or also in decimal. So the main thing is that this second parameter is your start of slave vector. This is a slave address that you're pointing to. In this case, MI10, since we're using a memory integer, offset starts at zero. You can just enter in 10 and be able to read that value. Now the read vector length is specified as one in this case. So the this is really just saying that we're only going to be reading address location 10, which is also equivalent to memory integer 10. If I had made this a two, it means we're going to read uh, memory address location 10 and 11, which corresponds to memory integer 10 and 11. So you can just read multiple registers if you increase the read vector length. Master start of vector. Now this location is where we're actually going to be placing the value that we went out in red. And it's saying we're going to store it now in MI5. So we went out, we read our address location 10, MI10 you can say, and we're going to be placing that value that we read into our master slave start of vector MI5. So MI5 is where the value that we just read is stored locally on the master device. And then what else we have here is really just a couple of status. We have three different status uh, operands that we could check out. MI0 is our status message. Double word zero is our sessions, and double word one is our acknowledgments. We'll take a look. If you click help on any of the commands, you'll see it brings you right to the correct spot in the help file. And what I'm looking for is our Modbus status operands. Let me just make this a little bit larger. So the value that we have in MI0 in this case if you have a zero in MI0, it means everything is good. Your status is okay. Some possible numbers you could be getting in there is a zero, one, two, three. Uh, it really just helps you try to debug and troubleshoot your application if your master is timing out or you have no communications or an illegal address. Uh, any of those Modbus uh, status messages will be placed in the, the number, and then you can see the equivalent number and a description of the error from the help file that shows your Modbus status operand. So you can always open up the help file and uh, be able to go in and see what those statuses correlate to. Now the sessions and the acknowledgments. Those two integers, or double words I guess in this case, are particularly useful if you're trying to see if a message is sent out, but if you're not receiving it, um, the total sessions will always show the number of read commands or write commands that have been, you know, issued. They've been sent out of the controllers. Um, and then the second, second parameter, the acknowledgments, should, should come back and tell you if it was successfully read or accepted. So basically you want your sessions to always equal your acknowledgments if you are reading and writing and successfully acknowledging without error. Your sessions and your acknowledgments should match. If there is a difference between them, that will generally mean that some data is being lost. Um, sometimes it's because you're polling it too frequently or other extraneous issues, but um, you can check your status message and also your sessions and your acknowledgments to, to troubleshoot. If you feel like you're losing data, you can use these three different status and session and acknowledgement operands to be able to troubleshoot and diagnose your system. And you can see we have pretty much the same setup in nets 4 and 5 for our write. Instead here, we're using a Modbus command number 16. Oops, our Modbus command number 16, which is our preset holding register, grabbed from the Modbus menu. We have our same set hold routine in our 2-net structure. And if I open this up, you'll see again it's, it's almost identical. You need to specify your slave address, so we want to go out and write to our slave ID number two on the Modbus network. 
or start a vector, um, address 20, again, which correlates to MI20. Um, so you just enter in the Modbus number for the address that you want to be able to read. In this case, we're reading 20. Our master vector, start a vector. Um, I don't know why this got changed. But um, our master start a vector. Wait, what is going on here? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, it, it has a, an incorrect label on it. But uh, we have our, our slave start a vector, and then the master start a vector is where we're going to be, be placing it, and then again the, the vector length as well. So the same sort of parameters as before, as well as the status messages and the total sessions and acknowledgments. So are there any other questions on the, the Modbus master? That's, that's really all that you need to, to have for the Modbus master. Again, you'd want to insert any of the, the read holding register commands or the, the preset holding registers for your specific system, addressing whatever operands or, or values that you're trying to read from your slave device. Okay, so we'll look at the the slave program next. So you can see there's not a whole lot going on in the slave program. Same as the master, we set up our PLC name, we set up our com initialization block. Also our MyBus config. In this case, you can see we're also using port 2, but the network ID is 2, which is why in our master application we were targeting our network ID 2, we were targeting our slave, which you can see here is defined as network ID 2. And just the standard units of time for 103, and our memory bit function in progress, uh, which really isn't used, the function in progress in the slave application, but you still define it anyway. So the main thing to, to make the slave program work and make it tick as a slave, what you want to have is the Modbus scan EX block. So this block, you'll see there's nothing to define in it. If I click it, nothing opens up. You just have to make sure you have this placed down against the rail, and it's going to constantly be scanning and constantly be looking for, for commands that are being issued from the master device and it's going to be allowing the master to access its registers by having this, this scan block. And the scan block is found under function blocks, Modbus, and then scan EX is the one that we're using. You can see there's a couple different versions here. We have scan EX, scan 32, and scan. Now, what are the differences between them? Um, generally speaking, you'd always want to use the scan EX block. It's the, the most up-to-date block that we have. If you had an older application, um, I believe it was between like Modbus or 2.0 or basically earlier programs, you'd want to use, for example, the scan block. Uh, so you just use the other ones if you have an older application. And I think it talks about it in the help file as well under, um, under the scans. Modbus scan, yeah. Uh, so it explains the, the scan and scan EX. It's, it's really just for, for older applications. You'd want to use the, the regular scan, but for most of them, scan EX will, will be sufficient. It'll suffice. It's the one that you want to use for, for most applications that you will have the scan EX. Place against the rail is all that you really need for the, the slave address, for the slave to be able to tick. And I mentioned you can also find it under the help. And then it is a little bit hidden, but it's under a ladder. And then FB's library, communication function blocks. And then Modbus is where I had been grabbing all of this information from. 
Um, you can see there's also a separate tab for Modbus IP. But all of the, the function blocks and command registers are, are essentially the same. So if you can, if you can program a Modbus RTU, there's not a whole lot different to be able to program Modbus IP. You're just really using the, the Ethernet as your physical medium instead of the, the RS-485 or RS-232. Now, I, I was talking earlier about 485. Our help file also explains our different 485 options that we have. And this is what I was looking for. Uh, network and wiring topology. This shows you how you can how you can wire up your network to be 485 and have multiple nodes on here. I mentioned earlier about a like an adapter that allows you to have the daisy chaining. The part number is available here as well. It's the MJ1022 CS66 is the one you want. But the graphic explains a little bit better. You have just the RJ11 that plugs into the side of your controller. And then it goes out and allows you to, to wire up your RS-485 as a two-wire connection. So it allows you to, to splice in, essentially, and, and daisy chain each, uh, each node, each network ID on your RS-485 network. So it, all, of, all the information that you would need to have about RS-485 actual physical wiring for Modbus, again, is available under the communications, and then your 485 options and about RS-485 and also the network topology explains pretty well here uh, from more from more reading later on if you were uh, wondering about how to actually set that up. And if there's no other questions, that's all the material that I have prepared for today. I want to say as well that we we are having all of our webinars they're going to be available online. We have a bunch that are available online already. Um, if you go to the main Unitronics page, we have them in two places. Under the support tab, you'll see we have a webinar section where you can go through and see some of them as well. Or if you hop on our forum, which is just forum.unitronics.com, the most recent one is generally the first thing that pops up when you go to our forum. In this case, the, the SD cards was the last one that we did about a week or two ago. Um, but if you click on Webinars Collection under the blogs, you'll see available as well are the different ones that we have. And just as an example, you can see we have the YouTube videos for the recorded webinars, also any questions or answers, and attached files. So the recording of today's webinar will be available online here, so you can go back and review any of the points that you had or any questions um, Any questions anyone asked will be available here, as well as downloading the two master and slave applications that I demonstrated and walked through today. Those will be available shortly online, so you can go back and, and download those as well. So in those two locations on our website, and uh, if there are no further questions, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. And again, I'll leave the webinar open for a short while longer to field any other questions that people may, may think of and, and want to type in an answer. But otherwise, thank you for attending and, and have a nice day.